You're listening to Sasquatch Syndicate. Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal? Or I can't tell. All I know is that my central light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. And all the ape believers don't want any of the paranormal believers to say anything because they're all whacked and screwed up and we don't want them. And all the paranormal believers don't want to go to the ape believers saying, well, you're all closed minded. You're not open to the fact that that does this and it does that. And I look over my left shoulder and this creature is running through the woods and it's bulldozing the brush down. And I knew, man, this thing is going to get me. Sasquatch Syndicate. I'm your host, Chuck, out in Seattle, Washington, along with Paul in Portland, Oregon. Thanks to everyone for listening and those following us at SasquatchSyndicate.com and on our social media outlets. Happy July, everyone. We hope you're having a wonderful summer season. Uh, tonight on Sasquatch Syndicate, we're going to be joined by gentleman Tim Flowers. He's a researcher out of Washington State, and Tim's had a lot of encounters over in northern Idaho. So bring Tim to the program tonight. So Tim, welcome to the program, and if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your background for our listeners. As a, as a kid, I had three encounters with Bigfoot. Um, I think I was probably five the first time I seen it. I was creek fishing. And I was down at the creek on a big rock, just sitting on it, trout fishing, and I could hear something cross the creek. And by the time I'd gotten up and went kind of around a little corner, I could see its head and shoulders going into the woods away from me. And I went and told my parents, and of course, they said it was a bear or whatever. And then the second time, I was probably 14, I was hunting with my dad and three brothers. and we had one cross the road, but it wasn't like directly in front of us. The time we got to it, we could just see part of its shoulder and its back and rear going into the woods. And my dad stopped the truck and said, what What was that? And the third time, in the same creek that I'd been fishing at before, as a little kid, I was up there, I was 17, fishing with a buddy, and we'd limited it out and we headed up the side of the embankment or it's a, a canyon to get to the logging road to walk back to camp and on the way up the hill we had jumped one sleeping or something because all we heard and seen was this crash it had jumped up and started running you could see fur part of it you couldn't really make it out exactly what it was and it, we followed it it had jumped the creek, and that's when we seen the footprint. And you could still hear it running. So, Tim, uh, where in northern Idaho did you grow up? I uh, grew up up, it's on the uh, Idaho, Montana, kind of Canada area, basically the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, over the years we've had a lot of reports, you know, in northern Idaho, you know, everywhere from Coeur d'Alene all the way up towards Eastport. But just kind of thinking back, you know, when you were watching these things jump over the creek, and I know you were younger, but do you remember how large those streams are? Yeah, um, I would say probably close to 15 feet. Anywhere from, yeah, about 12 to 15 feet. And then uh, later on, I, I joined the Marine Corps, and I spent eight years in the Marine Corps and went everywhere. And uh, when I finally got moved back up here uh, seven years ago, eight years ago, I started to go look for him to see what I'd seen. And I went up in April. Uh, I could get to about 2,500, 3,000 feet because of the snow. And me and my girlfriend at the time, uh, we were driving around um, not that long, actually. And I went to one area by a creek, and we found footprints, uh, 17 inches uh walking down an old logging road and we could see where it did a 360 and then went up the side of a mountain and 
I couldn't, we couldn't follow it anymore because the snow got too deep. We came back two weeks later and we were up in that same area. When we came on an old logging road, we were going down, uh, as I learned later on from doing this, like I said, for the last seven years, there's, I find that there's trees across the road and you know, you're in the woods, there's always trees across the road. And I always carry a chainsaw. Well, it wasn't until I started talking to other people who go bigfooting. They said, look at the trees and make sure the roots came from that area. And I started finding that these trees that are across the road, where there should be a root hole, there wasn't. And I think and it's, a, it's an alarm system for them is what I think it is. Because as we got up the road, we found a moose. It would have been last year's, it was a female moose, the last year's calf by the size of it, because it wasn't, you know, huge yet. But its head was ripped off. Its spine was still attached to the head, and its body was on the other side of the road, of this logging road. So one side of the logging road is the head with the spine still attached. The other side is its body. No meat had been eaten. Like a wolf will grab the ends of a, a moose or whatever it attacks. It grabs like the hind corners. This moose was fully intact. When I opened the moose up, all of its internal organs were gone. So, Tim, do you have any estimates on the size of that moose? That moose would address that probably around, because I elk hunted a lot as a kid, I would say it would have dressed out about 300. Yeah, that's really interesting. You think about the sheer strength of what would have had the power to rip that out. That had to be pretty intense. You know, too, uh, I thought it was interesting, too, you brought up, you know, the tree fall over the road. And uh, we run into that quite a bit. And Paul and I have been out a couple times and we've noticed that, too, where it's almost like it's deliberately placed to give, you know, kind of a warning system or give Sasquatch kind of ample opportunity to get ready for the arrival. This, like I said, it's been going on for seven years. And we've had, I've had many, many encounters. The second time we went up, where it's just starting to get daylight, and in the summer, you know how the daylight lasts forever. And I want to say it was around 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, because it was still dusk. And when we got to the place where we had found the tracks in the snow, now this is a month later, so the snow's melted, but uh, a, a cow elk came up out of the brush on the side of the road, on the passenger side, and... It, the roads are very rocky. They're very, I have a Jeep Rubicon. That's the only thing I know that drives well up there. Um, you go slow, but this elk came up out of the uh, side of us, out of the brush, and but it wasn't paying attention to us. You know, it wasn't startled by us. And I pulled maybe 15 feet in front of it and stopped, and it, it wasn't looking at us. It kept looking in back of it. We had gotten out of the Jeep, and, uh, I mean, I, I carry a gun in the woods at all times. I ran into bear, cougar, moose, you know, just for safety purposes. Anyway, we get out of the Jeep and we start hearing not whoops. It didn't go whoop. They, it was going whoop, whoop. It wasn't going like whoop. And there was three of them, one to our left one to our far right and one down below and they kept taking turns making this call and we started walking down the logging road a little ways and they kept getting closer and closer and closer and my friend had a uh, nine millimeter h and k and i had an ar-15 at the time and i told her just start shooting into this dirt bank and we emptied our clips and the noise stopped to be quite honest, I was getting very nervous because it was getting closer and closer and closer. Now, the elk, in the meantime, it turned around and walked down the road that we had came up, the logging road. And then it wasn't until the following, there was a forest fire the next year. I didn't go up. It went through that in the area. It was the year that it was so smoky all over the Pacific Northwest from Montana to Washington. We didn't go up, but the next year I went up, and where we had found the tracks before, 
had burned out a little, so I really didn't think I would find anything. I had put an apples on a stump. I've heard this before from other people. I put these apples on a stump, and when I came back in the morning, there was a giant rock sitting on the stump. And I mean a giant rock. I uh, carry a, uh, now I carry a 4570. The rock was as long as a Marlin 4570 rifle. Yeah, and thanks for sending those pictures in. And if you're subscribed on All Access, I actually put them out there. But that rock is massive. I don't know what could have lifted it up on that stump that far in. Certainly it would have taken me and a couple of my friends to put that up there. But I'm just curious, too. Now, when you go back, Tim, are you constantly just kind of going back to that same area? Uh, I'm working in an area because when I seen the rock on the stump, I started walking down to it and I froze and I could, I just felt, I felt danger. That's what it felt like to me. I felt like eyes were on me and I felt danger. I took out my cell phone. I took a picture of it, two of them. I walked and got back in my Jeep and got out of there. When I had gotten home, me and a buddy from work were looking at him and you could see its face in the background in the woods. So, of course, that motivated me even more to keep coming back to that area. Uh, so, when I leave Washington, it takes me nine hours to get to the mountain. Um, the next time I went up, I get because I leave at like eight o'clock, I get over there, you know, like five o'clock in the morning. I sleep, I park away from them uh, like a mile and a half or so, and I take a nap before I start looking around. Well, the time that I had done that, I had the windows down, and I'm sitting there trying to sleep, and I'm maybe into it about an hour, and I hear a very strong whistle. It was uh, in front of me, like down below me, to where I usually saw them, you know, like a mile down the road. And I started waking up a little bit, and then I heard another whistle in back of me. I look in my left, in my driver's side mirror, and I see a black figure down on all fours watching the Jeep, watching me, watching the Jeep. I grabbed my rifle. I jumped out of my Jeep. By the time I did that, it was already in the woods. But it left a beautiful hand impression to where the forest fire had burned through in the ash. And when I was looking at the hand, I kept thinking it was a foot because it was so huge. And I was like, no, it's maybe it's a smaller foot. You know, I, I was trying to make sense of it. And then I seen the thumb. And then I realized it was his hand. So, Tim, kind of thinking about, you know, your drive out from Washington, you know, that's quite a trek there to northern Idaho. Yeah. Um, throughout this process, I, I went, you know, I go every summer and I've, I've seen him five times throughout the seven years. I've actually... It was raining one time when I was up there and I do my hoops and hollers and I was down behind a fallen tree in the kind of in the hole where the stump had, you know, when the, when the stump lifts up, it leaves a hole in the earth. I was kind of down in that and I'm watching with my binoculars. And I look to my left and no more, I would say, than 200 yards. There was two of them peeking behind a tree and a female standing broadside to me. The female that was standing broadside to me had a baby, and it was holding it on its shoulder. And I got a picture of them. Um, about every, like I said, every year I seem to get at least one picture. They won't come completely out of the woods. I can't get them to come completely out of the woods. I haven't figured out where they go in the winter. I have a clue where they go. I know they go, they have to come down. <laughs> they have to come down the mountains because where I go in the winter, there's eight to 10 feet of snow in, in the dead of winter. So they have to come down. Either that or they got a cave system. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. I was kind of, you know, thinking about that the other day and you know my prevailing theory at least the one I'm subscribed to right now is that they're going underground in caves or lava tubes and when I was out in the Olympics you know last winter 
Um, you know, there's some great sulfur streams. And if you can get down those lava tubes, it's pretty temperate down there. But that's just kind of my gut. I do know they follow the creeks and rivers. I'm 100% positive. And they are very, very meticulous about not leaving footprints. I'm, I'm almost 100% positive they stay in the water to avoid it. Now, Tim, as you've been having these encounters in these areas, did you run across any odors or anything peculiar? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've never, I can't say I've ever smelled one. One, I can't smell very well. I mean, I just I kind of lost my sense of smell. It has to be very, very strong. But I've never smelled them. And what I thought odd, you know, you watch on TV and all this stuff about them throwing rocks and trees and <clears throat> I've never ever gotten that. I've never had any kind of a violent encounter to where they you know, like a try attacking me. Where where I go, I'm lucky if I see any kind of people throughout the my whole trip up there. And Tim, you said you think th this is a clan of about four? Yeah, I was positive. I was pretty positive on that. But in May, I got a kind of a weird picture of one I've never seen before. They, they all don't look the same. There's two of them that kind of look similar. They look kind of like a troll. <laughs> that's how I describe them as a troll. But then there's a male that's very large. And it's very furry as far as facial hair and its hair. It's, it's got more hair on its face. And then the female, the female, I didn't see hair on its face. <coughs> their skin, I mean, they're, they're all black. I've never seen a brown or a reddish or anything. They're all black. And the female doesn't have any fair hair on her face. The, the one, the, the rock incident, the, the, when I found the giant rock on the stump, it reminded me, I grew up on a reservation over there in uh, Idaho, and it reminded me of an old Indian, its face. So, Tim, kind of observing these over time, are you seeing juveniles that kind of grow into adults? Or you, you mentioned babies a couple times, but are you seeing development of that clan? Uh... <laughs> When I seen the the smaller one and then a larger one and then the female with the baby, <coughs> I can't say is the size wise because I never get a clear picture of their entire body. When they play peekaboo behind trees, is they will like I said I can't get them to come out. They're constantly I'll see half their body. Last year I had one it was on his knees. And I was watching to the left because I could see the one moving in the sunlight through the trees. And again, I know it makes them nervous when I'm there because they move, they, they're moving around. They're like nervous. You, you know what I mean? You just get that nervous, like they're nervous. I'm watching it and then I look a little to the right and I see two glowing eyes back in the forest. And that's when the one on the right popped out. And, but he was, had to been down on his knees because all I could see was his shoulder, his face, and part of his chest. But uh, I, I can't tell how fast they're growing because I, I'm not for sure. I don't ever see the whole, you know, the, the from feet on up, I don't see that. And do you believe that they're all from the same family grouping? Yes, I think what this area, particular area, there, there's a tree. The area was logged, I want to say, 13 years ago. And there's a little clearing. <coughs> and I go to the top of the clearing, and there at the bottom by the creek. The, they, there's a tree probably, I don't know, 15 feet tall. But down from that tree, there's a big, there's some branches. There's an old branch that was bent in a circle and woven into the other branches. Now, I just noticed this three years ago that it's there, you know, that I actually caught my eye and was like, wow, that's weird. How did this get this way? And I looked back through my pictures and I could see that it's been that way for at least the last six years. Last year in August, uh, me and a friend went up there 
and we're looking around. Uh, we're not finding anything during that day, and we go back, and then we come back in the morning, and that limb that was in a circle was taken out. And I don't know if, if there's significance. I don't know if that's them telling other Sasquatches they're there. I, I don't know. But there's no way a human could have, uh, unless you took a ladder and took time and wove that branch up into the other ones. But I would find that hard to believe. Now, Tim, you had mentioned that these areas had probably been logged before, maybe more than a decade ago. But have you talked to anybody up there just about what they know around that area? I talked to loggers and that, and I mean, between potlatch logging and, uh, oh, what's the other one, Vic, Vic something logging company, um, they've made it difficult, because once I talked to the head guy, they were up there on a four-wheeler scouting out their, where they were going to log for the summer, and I actually showed them pictures of the Bigfoots, and of course, they wanted to know where, and I wouldn't tell them where. But they kind of had an idea because they kept catching me in the same area. Uh, last October, they actually logged part of that area. So, Tim, I, I think you said you're going to head back up that way. But um, I definitely want to keep in touch with you and find out uh, a little bit more on your next uh, trip there. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, kind of reporting back to the show. All right. If you uh, you find out anything, I don't know. I'd appreciate it if you let me know. And I'll let you know how the uh, how the mission went. All right. Well, that's going to do it with Tim Flowers, and we'll keep you guys up to date on his latest adventures. Again, if you're listening on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button and the bell for the latest notifications. This concludes our July 2019 podcast. Sasquatch Syndicate will return on Thursday, August 1st. Thanks to all of our listeners and those that have been out to our website and those following us on social media. Sasquatch is a controversial subject. So for all the believers and disbelievers and those that will tell you they have all the answers, just remember, we're flying through space at 700 miles per hour. Buckle up.